Welcome to Worship at Bethel, originating from Bethel Lutheran Church in Madison, Wisconsin. Bethel Lutheran Church is a vibrant urban congregation, living lives of worship and praise, loving one another through faith, community, and care, serving all and God's world, and thriving by faithful stewardship. Our mission is loving and serving Jesus Christ and the world. Welcome, good friends and guests, in the name of the one who reaches into our world and blesses us and holds us and loves us, Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you this day that we can come together and be a part of your holy community, your family. We pray, Lord, that you would help us to broaden our vision and our understanding of those we call our own. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The reading this morning is from Deuteronomy, the book of Deuteronomy. And this, the words here come following Israel's miraculous deliverance from Egyptian slavery. They are now wandering in the desert, being trained to trust in God's sovereignty after living in a polytheistic culture for centuries. The Lord your God is supreme over all gods and over all powers. He is great and mighty, and he is to be obeyed. He does not show partiality. He does not accept bribes. God makes sure that orphans and widows are treated fairly. He loves the foreigners who live with our people and gives them food and clothes. So then, Show love for those foreigners because you were once foreigners in Egypt. Have reverence for the Lord your God and worship only him. Be faithful to him and make your promises in his name alone. Praise him. He is your God and you have seen with your own eyes the great and astounding things that he has done for you. When your ancestors went to Egypt, There were only 70 of them, but now the Lord your God has made you as numerous as the stars in the sky. The word of the Lord.
The Holy Gospel according to Matthew. When the Son of Man comes in glory and all the angels with Him, then He will sit on the throne of glory. All the nations will be gathered before Him, and He will separate people one from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And He will put the sheep at His right hand and the goats at the left. Then the King will say to those at His right hand, Come, you that are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food, or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when was it that we saw you a stranger and welcomed you, or naked and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you sick or in prison and visited you? And the king will answer them, Truly I tell you, Just as you did it to the one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. Then he will say to those at his left hand, you that are accursed, depart from me into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and you did not welcome me, naked and you did not give me clothing, sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. And then they will answer, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not take care of you? Then he will answer them, truly I tell you, just as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. The gospel of the Lord. In 1984, uh, Madonna, the, the rock star, not the mother of our Lord, broke out with her second album, and on that album the second release was the song Material Girl. And while I don't really and didn't then appreciate uh, Madonna's music or her demeanor or character, I do appreciate this phrase from that song, because we're living in a material world, and I am a material girl. The song lifts up what I want to lift up for you today with our focus and celebration this Mission Sunday. As you can see, we have quilts and care kits, baby care kits, personal care kits, and school kits, and fabric kits. And we have along either side of the sanctuary here flags where these kits um, have gone to the countries where we have sent these for the past uh, four years. We live in a material world, and we have literally material that we are sending around. And this is important for us because as we look at Scripture— and we learn about who it is that we are and what we are to be about, we first of all need to recognize and see that we we have an embodied faith. Our faith, our connection with God, our devotion is an embodied devotion. We see this early on right away, right from the very first words of Scripture. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, when God steps in and begins to act, God creates 
and brings into existence a material world, a world that you can touch, feel, smell, and see, and taste. And when Jesus enters the world to bring about redemption, salvation, John chapter 1 says that uh, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word became flesh, took on human form, assumed and took on a body. Our God became incarnate, became part of the material existence of our world. Our faith is an embodied faith. And so when God intervenes and acts in the lives of people in the world and in the Scripture, there is a material, physical, actual component to it. We saw that in the reading today from Deuteronomy. And inside your bulletin, there is an outline for this. If you would pull that open, I want you to turn to the center, and I want us to read together this passage from Deuteronomy chapter 10, but only verses 18 and 19. So, if you would, let's read it together where it starts, He makes sure that orphans. Would you please? He makes sure that orphans and widows are treated fairly. He loves the foreigners who live with our people, and He gives them food and clothes. So then, show love for those foreigners, because you were once foreigners in Egypt. We see that when God intervenes and brings about salvation for people, as they look to God, as they receive God's blessings and and, and goodness, what they receive is they receive actual food, and they receive actual clothing, material. God feeds and clothes. God steps into the world in very concrete ways to to bless. God's blessing isn't simply a blessing upon people's minds or their hearts or their spirits. It's not just about their souls where God pronounces forgiveness and grace and all that, but actual food and clothing. Our faith is an embodied faith, and our mission is a material mission. A second thing we need to keep in front of us and be aware of is it's not only an embodied faith, but it's a costly faith. Because as we live in the world, the things that we share with others and the things that God shares with us, they come with a cost. There's an actual price tag. When we send these quilts and these kits, we have to pay for the postage and for the shipping to get them somewhere. That that takes money. Whenever people make the quilts, they have to uh, scrounge, find, or even purchase the fabric, and, and we have to pay for that. And for those who volunteer to cut and to tie and to sew, that costs time. And, and to be about God's work in the world, to be about God's activity in our creation, we need to understand that this faith is costly. And that's what it says here in Matthew 25. Whenever Jesus, the Bible says in Matthew, at the end of time, Jesus comes back as king, as regent, as ruler, and gathers people before him and says, then the king says to those on his right hand, come you that are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, you gave me food. I was thirsty, you gave me drink. I was a stranger, you welcomed me. I was naked and you gave me clothing. I was sick and you took care of me. I was in prison and you visited me. The thing that Jesus commends and compliments and lifts up, congratulates and blesses for those who have been his followers, his servants, is the fact that they they bore the cost. They they, they stepped out. They gave. They reached into their pockets. They reached into their time. They reached into their energy resources to to bless and to bring others and to help others. And, And our ways of bearing the cost of discipleship are many. I mean, we, I can recall as a child, not a, as a young man, as a teenager, my, 
my, one of my first experiences of, of giving uh, to the mission of the church. Of course, I was an acolyte with confirmation and all that kind of stuff. But we had a, a youth choir, and, and so I was in the youth choir. And I gave my time, and I gave my voice, and, and I had a pretty decent pitch at the time. And I had a range of about five or six notes that I could hit those pretty, pretty regularly. But our choir director thought that, you know what, Mike, you've got such a, a good pitch, we ought to have you to sing a solo. I said, well, I can do that. And this is like early seventh grade. And so we planned, and it was on the schedule, the church calendar. And so the day when, when, when little Mike Brown was going to sing a solo in church, I, 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 was, I was good with that. Until... Uh, as the months rolled on in seventh grade, I began to go through those, those um, early manhood changes, you, you know what I'm saying? Began to get a little hair where I didn't have it before on my, my chin, and my, my, above my lip, and, and I began to, my voice was a little bit less reliable. It'd crack here and there. And the closer I got to the, the day in church and I was going to sing that solo, it was cracking more and more, and I was just getting nervous. So I told our choir director, you know what, I, I don't know if I can do this or not. I, I can't hit those notes regularly. And so she decided to have my, my best friend, Ronnie Sims, to make it a, a, a duet. We'll sing it together because his voice is a little bit more steady right now. And so we're in church, and, and, and the, the, the balcony, the choir loft is right, right over here. And it's a little bit elevated. And so there's 500,000 people in the congregation. (laughs) It was a packed house, not 500,000, but a bunch of them. And we get there, we're singing. And and sure enough, we get to that solo that I'm going to have to do with my friend Ronnie in in unison. And belt and get out. And oh my Lord, my voice cracks like a crack a clap of thunder, of lightning. It just cracked and split. And I could see the faces in the congregation, people out there just grinning. And my friend Ronnie just burst out laughing. And he just dropped down to the floor behind the little wall there. And I was left all by my lonesome to finish that solo. My voice cracking. That wasn't a pleasant experience, I mean, but that was part of my early education on giving to the Lord. And sometimes it goes great when you give to the Lord. It goes according to the plan, and sometimes it doesn't go according to the plan. There's all kinds of ways that people give and share the load and bear the cost of uh, being a part of God's work in the world, this mission, this material mission. And, and we do it by singing. We, we do it by ushering. We do it by helping count the money in the church. We do it by showing up and, and giving of our finances. And, and so uh, the, the, one of the great theologians, one of the great Lutherans in our church's history was Dietrich Bonhoeffer. And he wrote a book called The The Cost of Discipleship. He he wrote letters from prison because Dietrich Bonhoeffer lived during the days of the Nazi regime and Adolf Hitler. And he was just deeply opposed to all that that represented. And this is what he says. There remains an experience of incomparable value. We have for once learned to see the great events of world history from below, from the perspective of outcasts, the suspects, the maltreated. In short, uh, from the perspective of those who suffer, mere waiting and looking on is not Christian behavior. Christians are called to compassion and to action. And many of you know that through many years have have been in action with your faith. I know that we as a church, Bethel, have historically been a church about action. And these quilts, these kits, are just the tip of the iceberg. If you look back over the church's history, you know, you'll see that we, we do a lot of things here locally. We have the, uh, a food pantry that feeds thousands of people every year. We have a a homeless support program that brings welcome and hospitality and food and clothing to people who are on the streets. 
Here locally, we support a, a church in Milwaukee called Hippotha, and it's an inner city church there in Milwaukee, and they do incredible work in the most extreme poverty, and so we are there with them providing financial support as well. We also, as a church, helped get the Nehemiah Center off the ground back in the days of Bill White. The Nehemiah Center is, a, is an organization that's connected with uh, Dr. Alex G. and Community Faith of Church, and, and it's about the business of creating racial reconciliation and healing, and we're, we're a part of that. We also, in this church, historically, have had missions and outreach in Poland and the Ukraine. We, we still uh, give support uh, to Dennis in Ukraine. Uh, we have, in this church, been able to support and be a part of mission in Rwanda recently, and in Bhutan, so the Nepali speaking group that we have here in the weekends on Saturdays is a group that we sponsored uh, with the UN and Lutheran Social Services to uh, bring them and to help resettle them many, many years ago, 10, 15 years ago. These are things that we have done. We, we have mission to Puerto Rico and we have missions in these quilts and there are 16 countries, 17 countries. Uh, that we have sent supplies and quilts to. And these quilts, you know what they get used for? Well, yeah, they get used for bedding, but also for protection. They become little shelters. So people will use these as set up little sticks and create little tents. Use them for shelter, for, for protection, to cover them from the elements and exposure to all that's out there. So at Bethel, I'll tell you what. Historically, we have been a church that's been about stepping into the world in a very real and concrete, material way because here at Bethel, we have understood this is an embodied faith and, and this is a costly thing. And so, we together have been a part of God's work in the world. And it says in Proverbs chapter 31 that... Uh, that the, a woman of faith, a person of faith is somebody who puts their hands to work and sows for the poor and gives generously to the poor and those in need. And these are things that, that we have lived out as a congregation. We can lift that up and celebrate that. And, and today at the next service, we'll, we'll have a blessing for all these quilts and kits. We have an embodied faith. We have a a costly faith, and, and we have a transforming faith because as we, we do these things and we invest ourselves and take the burden upon ourselves, then what happens is, is that people's lives are touched and blessed and things change. Now, things are transformed. That's what it said in Deuteronomy, that, that God makes sure that the orphans and the widows are treated fairly. And God loves the foreigners who live within our midst and giving them food and clothes. And so we do the same for others. And we see that in Matthew 28, that Jesus says that all the authority in heaven and on earth have been given to me. So go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, and you baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teach them to obey all that I have commanded you. And remember that I am with you always to the ends of the ages. All this work, all these activities, all this, this energy that we expend. Uh, as a congregation is a part of Christ's mission. He says, go out there and declare and teach and do and put your faith into action. And that's precisely what Bethel has done for, for decade after decade. And we can lift that up and celebrate that. And that's God's blessings upon all those who gather and all those who receive uh, what we have put out. My hope and prayer for you, my good friends, is that as the weeks, months, and years roll along, is that you will continue to invest and to put your back into it, to dig down and find ways to, to impact the world, because that's precisely what it means to be a member of Bethel. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for the ways you work. We thank you for the, the deep commitment that you have had to your, your creation, this material world. We thank you, Lord, that, that you bore the cost, that you did not hold anything back. You sent your son to the cross to bear our sins. And Lord, you, you also send us to bear the cost, to take 
things on our shoulders and put our backs into it. We ask, Lord, that you would give us strength, that you would give us focus, that you would give us vision to do what it is you have called us to do. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, and after he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people, for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord's face shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Amen.